read this evening from Exodus chapter 10, from verse 21, and then from Matthew's Gospel chapter 15, from verse 29. Exodus chapter 10, verse 21. Let's hear the word of God. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take heed to yourself, and see my face no more. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, you have spoken well. I will never see your face again. And then from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, and from verse 29. Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then a great multitude, multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven, and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were four thousand men, beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude, got into the boat, and came to the region of Magdala. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came to him, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have not brought, you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, 
but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to us uh, this evening. Turn again then to Matthew chapter 15. And uh, I'll just read from... uh, Chapter 16, verse 5, when the disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, tonight we're looking at this passage that deals with the feeding of the four thousand and the following debate about uh, miracles and food with the Pharisees and with uh, the Lord's. Uh, disciples on that occasion and some find uh, some uh, of the details here obviously I'm not going to go over again because uh, we find the story of the 5,000 being fed in chapter 11 we've already looked at that and uh, both miracles share uh, obviously share um, many aspects for example the Savior's compassion is emphasized in both those miracles an abundance of food is supplied by uh, the division of a few loaves and fishes. fishes. Both miracles occur in a remote place. Uh, The Lord Jesus even repeats an identical question. How many loaves do you have, he says. And uh, in both cases, all who eat are satisfied, we're told. So the first thing I want us to notice tonight is this is not an account of a second account of the same miracle. Uh, So what does Matthew want us to understand from it? There's no doubt that he's claiming that this is another and a different occasion of the feeding of a multitude, different from the feeding of the 5,000 that took place in uh, in chapter 11. Many features of the the two miracles are, are quite different from each other. Here the crowd has been with the Lord Jesus, we're told, for three days. Uh, There are also a thousand fewer present on this occasion. Uh, It's not said here that they were men, but that they were men and women together. It was a mixed group. The number of the fish is not specified in this account. And the Greek word for fish here is quite different from from the fish referred to in the feeding of the 5,000. And the baskets are different and the loaves also are are different and the number of fragments collected is is less there's no grass for people to sit on as there was in the earlier account and and the the basket you'll remember that word large the word for basket here uh, is different from the earlier passage this basket is the type of basket in which um, Paul was let down, you remember, from the walls of uh, Damascus. This is a large uh, basket. And uh, the disciples don't express here any scepticism about providing food for this crowd, just the fact that they were helpless to find food in the wilderness. And even more significant, the Lord refers to the earlier miracle, doesn't he? Um, Don't you remember, he says, when I broke the fish uh, and the loaves and fed the 5,000? And as you might expect, unbelieving scholars look at these uh, passages and they say, well, this now is a fictitious repetition of the earlier miracle. How could such a miracle in which thousands are fed from a handful of loaves be claimed as a fictitional uh, repetition of an earlier miracle that did occur. 
Uh, Many people in Galilee and Decapolis were still alive when Mark published his gospel. And uh, this gospel then, when it had started to circulate, people would have said, well, this is fake. This is a conspiracy. But it's not. It's a true account. And of course, people point out the parallels between the two incidents and uh, they, they think that proves then that this is just a, a copy. It's a, a fictional repetition. I'd say to that, let's think back to uh, 9-11 and the towers there in uh, New York. Uh, we've, we watched with horror that occasion, didn't we? Those two planes crashing into those skyscrapers at two different times on the same day and those two towers crashing down. Well, imagine 2,000 years from now and someone's writing his PhD theory on the conspiracy of the Twin Towers, saying, well, of course, there was only one tower and, of course, there was only one plane and this has all been conflated. Uh, How could we possibly believe that this happened twice? You see, there are astonishing coincidences, we might say, that occur in our own lives far more frequently than we appreciate. Bible Critics have looked at the disciples' question here in verse 33 where they say, where can we find enough food to feed these men in the desert? And they say, well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Because it's so soon after Jesus fed 5,000. They wouldn't be asking this question again, surely. But I'd say, what would Jesus say if these men had turned to him and said, well, well, go on, do it again? What, um, What presumption that would be? the Lord Jesus wasn't a vending machine. He wasn't there just to turn out miracles to satisfy our curiosity and our desires. He's the sovereign Lord and these disciples are slowly learning that. Now at this point the Lord Jesus has been in the region of Decapolis for several months and the disciples I'm sure couldn't have failed to have noticed over those months how many Gentiles were coming to hear Jesus. And we have in the previous chapter the account of the Syrophoenician woman, that Gentile woman coming and asking about her daughter and her healing. And you remember how surprising that account is. This is a largely Gentile area. There are, Christ- there are Jews there also, but it's largely a Gentile area. And the disciples are aware of that. And they see how Jesus is ministering to Gentiles. And they've heard him speak about giving the children's bread to dogs. Why should Jesus be expected to feed a multitude of Gentiles? He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when the Lord Jesus did a miracle, you see, on every occasion it was breathtakingly shocking for the disciples. They never anticipated any miracle that Jesus performed. They never got used to it. They never took it in their stride. What manner of man is this? They're repeatedly saying in the Gospels. It was the enemies of Jesus who were asking for miracles and expecting them, not not the disciples. You don't find the disciples going to Jesus in Decapolis asking for miracles. Rather, they are perplexed. Where can we find enough food to feed a crowd like this in the wilderness? They're as worried and bothered by that as you and I would be. And remember the timing of the miracle, that the Lord had been with the disciples for another period of about nine months, travelling from Tyre via Sidon, in the north, down through these ten towns of Decapolis, a mixed Jew and Gentile area, but largely Gentile, going around those places, patiently teaching with his disciples and speaking to anyone and everyone who would hear him. And in doing that, he has gathered together a following, a crowd of people who follow him from place to place, and now in his judgment, they need to see this sign of multiplying loaves and fishes. And it was that they might learn just who it is that Jesus of Nazareth is. There's no doubt that the Lord Jesus 
repeated much of his teaching in different places. We have those astonishing words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. But then those are repeated, very largely repeated, in what we call the Sermon on the Plain. The same teaching comes again. And in the miracles of Jesus, there were repetitions of miracles, miracles of healing. There are three resurrections from the dead. Uh, different women sat at his feet and anointed him with oil. He cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry. But then again, at the end of his ministry, he goes into the temple and and very provocatively overturns the tables of the money changers and brings upon himself the wrath of the religious leaders and their enmity is let loose against Jesus on that occasion. So Matthew is teaching us here again that Jesus fed a large crowd of men and women multiplying loaves and fishes. He had done so before, but now he repeats the miracle in Decapolis and we need to see that and to see that the message of the miracle is just who is this person think about who this person is all of the Lord's miracles are signs you see they are signs that point to Jesus himself and tell us who he is that he's not just some healer or some teacher he's not just a, a tender-hearted loving man um, there are very similar miracles uh, recorded uh, here then the feeding of the five thousand the feeding of the four thousand and in recording these Matthew is trying to build up for us an extraordinary picture of who this person is, Jesus Christ. It's, it's a bit like going to the cinema and seeing these 3D films that they make and you have to wear those uh, strange little glasses that they, they give, give you and you, you watch the film and something is thrown towards the camera and you think it's going to come out of the screen and hit you and if you're sort of watching a film of a car chase or whatever, you could be flinching, thinking you're going to be in, in a, an accident. You close your eyes sometimes. That 3D effect is created by two cameras filming the same event from two slightly different perspectives and then those are brought together those images are brought together wearing those uh, glasses that they give you to wear on those occasions uh, to give you a real sense of depth in the picture a 3d effect that's what mark is doing when uh, sorry matthew is doing when he records two accounts of miracles uh, the feeding of the 5,000 the feeding of the 4,000 is to create this really vivid picture so that we understand who Jesus is it's as if the camera zooms in on him and uh, you see that he's in control of everything that's going on and it's all about revealing his glory who is he well we could say he's the good Samaritan Remember that story that Jesus told of a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and a gang of thieves beat him and rob him and he's left half dead lying on the side of the road and two professional religious men of his own nation come down, see him, pass by on the other side and then a man from a different nation, a nation hated by his own people, comes and ministers to him his plans are changed for the day and he gets his hands dirty and his clothes dirty and he uses his own money and puts his own effort into helping this man and Jesus you remember says now be like him be a good neighbor like him but Jesus doesn't just talk about doing that he does it himself he exemplifies it here he sees 4,000 people and they're hungry and he starts to think about them and to think out loud and he says I can't send these home hungry like this they'll collapse on the on the way they've come come such a long distance that mustn't happen people collapsing through weariness so notice how tender Jesus is have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus never once had to withdraw his words how often we have to do that he never misspoke 
never spoke out of place, never said the wrong thing, never had to apologise for what he said. We have to very often. And this same Jesus is with us today, and he is as tender today as he has ever been, and as sympathetic and compassionate, and he sees our future, your future, and he knows what is down the road for you, and the difficulties that you are going to face on that road, and he like the Good Samaritan, comes alongside to help, unless you wave him away, unless you want him to pass you by, and you don't want his help, and you won't call him to come to you with his grace. This Good Samaritan is with us, and he sees us, and he'll stop where we are, and he will help us. So, He's the one who's being portrayed to us in this, in this uh, miracle then of the feeding of the 4,000. And uh, the Bible is calling us to put our trust in this Saviour. It's saying, uh, don't walk that journey of life alone. Don't do it on your own. This Saviour will go with you. The one who says, lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the world. So don't, don't face life without Christ. Listen to him when he says, I have compassion upon these people. He's compassionate for you now. And there is no other saviour as tender or as compassionate as this saviour. He's the good shepherd. He's also the great, the mighty creator. Look at verse 35. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks broke them and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of fragments that were left. Just think about that. Seven little loaves. Jesus prays and breaks the loaves, and he keeps on breaking them and distributing them. And on and on and on it goes, hundreds of times, probably thousands of times, so that he creates, I don't know, a ton of food, bread and fish, and everyone eats and is satisfied, and seven large baskets of broken pieces are left over. So this wasn't a symbolic supper like the Lord's table, where you take the little bit of bread and you have your little cup of wine. It's not a symbolic feast. These people eat and they're satisfied. Piles of bread heaps of fish sufficient for thousands of people and the question is who could do such a thing well not some magician this isn't something you see on telly on a saturday night where someone just pulls something out of his sleeve or whatever this is the god who spoke into being the newly formed world let the waters teem with living creatures he said be fruitful and multiply this is the god who took a fully grown woman out of the side of Adam, the first man. And here he is now in the flesh, in this remote area in the region of Decapolis on planet Earth. Only he could feed 4,000 people with a few loaves and fishes. It's one of the astonishing claims of the Bible that the Creator has become created. The sustainer of heaven and earth has entered into the world and become dependent. That the Almighty has become weak. That uh, the God who is from all eternity has entered time and become subject to it. God has become a man. Whilst not laying aside any of his divine attributes, but added to himself all the qualities that make a true man and he turned water into wine he formed eyeballs in the heads of blind men he creates mountains of food with a handful of bread and fish and feeds a hungry crowd this is the lord who is with us now all powerful to be our help and to take us safely to heaven and i ask you then how will you face an unknown future without him how can you face death and all that lies beyond death? How can you face meeting God without 
Jesus Christ. And we're to receive him then as God and Saviour, uh, even now if we're to face that, um, that future that lies before us with any confidence. It shows him to be the mighty creator. It shows him also to be the promised Messiah. Because uh, the living God once made a covenant and made promises in that covenant. One day he said Messiah, that is God's anointed one, the one he would send to be the saviour, would come into the world. And though God revealed himself in an amazing way through Moses and through the prophets, one day he was going to come closer to his creatures than anybody could have imagined. Intimately, he would expose himself to the gaze of sinners, to their questions, to their curses, to the cross that they would hang him on. And when those days of the Messiah came, God told the prophets, said to Isaiah, for example, that men would know that he was the Christ because he would supply bread for the hungry. Remember in Isaiah 55, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy and eat, without money, without price. Why do you spend money for bread which cannot satisfy, and your wages for that which is not bread? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in an abundance. And when Mary, you remember, was told that she would be the mother of uh, the one that God was sending into the world as a saviour, she spoke then of the Lord who would satisfy the hungry with good things. Now think then how this miracle of the feeding of the 4,000 fits into and in with all the prophecies concerning Messiah and his coming into the world, that he'd be of the royal line of David, that he would be born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, having to be summoned out of Egypt, uh, that uh, the dumb would speak, the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would leap, leap like a deer. All of those prophecies were fulfilled. Betrayed by one of his friends, die suffering in anguish, despised and rejected by men, buried in a rich man's grave, and raised up on the third day. There are scores and scores of prophecies made about him, and every one fulfilled. And in the midst of all those prophecies was this particular one that he would feed the hungry, satisfying them with good things. And more than that, that the Gentiles would be blessed by his coming, that he would be bread for them as well as for the Jews spiritual bread for a pagan world found in Christ. That is, for you and for me. Spiritual bread. The people who sit in darkness will see a great light and hear that prophecy is being fulfilled. It's like a great three-dimensional sign pointing to Christ as the anointed one who fulfills all these promises of God. And it's a miracle that confirms to us that Jesus is the bread of life. This is a mixed crowd of Jews and Gentiles. Some of them would have understood and known about the great deliverance of their people from Egypt under Moses, from slavery. God had led the people through the wilderness and in the wilderness had fed them with manna, with bread from heaven. It had been their staple diet for nearly 40 years. They survived in the wilderness because God fed them. Then one day, Jesus of Nazareth appears on the scene. He's the promised king, John the Baptist has said. And he shows his kingly power in the world, over creation, over the waves, over the wind, storms, fish of the deep, bread. He walks on the water. He turns water into wine. And they all obey his will. And then he preaches, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. I am the bread that comes down from heaven, of which if a man eats, he will never die. He is the bread of life. My flesh is 
Now this bread is my flesh which I will give, he says, for the life of the world. Remember how on the last night before going to the cross, he took bread and said, this is my body, broken for you. How do we know that Jesus is the bread of life? How do we know that if we eat of him, that is, if we really take him inside ourselves, that we'll live forever? How do we know that his body was broken for us on the cross? How do we know that those are just not words? Well, twice he confirms the absolute truth of those words by mighty miracles. And a miracle is, is an event in the external world brought about by the immediate power of God for a specific purpose of signifying, of being a sign. And this miracle signifies to us that Jesus is the Good Samaritan, the mighty creator, the promised Messiah, the bread of life. And you and I need to know that. We need to know that we cannot, just as we cannot eat only by, uh, we cannot live only by eating, cannot live by bread alone, the scripture says. God has made us in his image, so we're not just like sheep out on a hillside with our heads down, chomping through grass and just going on, eating, eating, eating until we die. Animals live like that because they are animals. They live to eat. But we are not just animals. We are more than that. We are more valuable than animals. And you are, to, you are able then to consider the heavens. You look up at the sky. You look at the stars at night time. The animals don't do that. You have a conscience that tells you that serving and helping others is right and that living just for yourself, that's just not the way things should be. You have a conscience that tells you that. You can read the Sermon on the Mount. You can hear those amazing words spoken by Jesus, the most glorious words that the world has ever heard. Animals can't do that, but you can. The God who made you in his own image has made himself known to us in Jesus, in his only begotten Son, by his teaching, by his great works, especially by his death and his resurrection on the third day, he is declared to be the Son of God with power. And we can know him. We can know him. You know, the nursing homes in this valley and all across our country are full of people who have lived their lives by bread alone. And now their fine clothes don't fit them anymore. And their cheeks are sunken and their, their shoulders are bowed and sagging skin. Uh, they can't live life as they once did and wanted to. They can't even read the paper. Their money's no use to them now, is it? What lies before them? People everywhere have lived for bread alone. And they found that bread is not a saviour. So what do we offer them? Well, you offer them more pills to try and cheer their spirit and to lift them up. But man can't live by pills alone either. And they face the grave without Jesus Christ. And without the God that they've shut out of their lives. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And we're to feed on him and never die. That's what this miracle is here to teach us. I'm sufficient for all the world, he says, and all the world's needs. We're also taught in this passage not to test God, not to try to put God to the test, because hearing of the miracles of Jesus, some of us might be tempted to think, well, if only I was there myself. If only I could have seen these loaves and fishes being multiplied. If only I could have eaten some of that food myself and heard Jesus saying these things, then probably I would have become a disciple of Jesus. I want to remind you, the Pharisees were sitting in this crowd. They saw everything that happened and they tasted this food themselves and they heard Jesus preach. 
Judas was there. Judas was there hearing the Sermon on the Mount. Judas tasted this bread. But neither Judas nor these Pharisees became disciples of Jesus because it takes more than miracles to make man a Christian. Jesus was always being asked to perform miracles by people and he was always very stern in refusing to do so. A sinful and an adulterous generation, he says, seeks for signs. The itch for seeing miracles is no sign that anyone has saving faith. If anything, it's the very reverse. Pilate sent Jesus to Herod during his trial, you remember. And we're told Herod was pleased. He was waiting to see Jesus. He'd always wanted to meet him because he wanted to see him perform a miracle. Jesus wouldn't perform a miracle for him. Jesus wouldn't even speak to him. Because he's not a magician and he's not a conjurer. We're told here that the Pharisees came to dispute with him, seeking a sign, testing him. Why does this generation always seek a sign, Jesus says? We're told there that the word that's used of the Pharisees in verse 1 of chapter 16, coming to Jesus, is uh, the word uh, that is used to describe uh, a military formation. They come almost like a, a rank of soldiers marching up to Jesus to confront him and to dispute with him, to oppose him. We want a sign from heaven, they say. We want, as it were, to see God opening heaven and saying, this is my beloved son. And you might think, well, here's the golden opportunity. We know that Jesus can, can perform miracles, so why not now? Why not win some of these people over? Why not pick up a pitcher of water and turn it into wine? Why not walk out onto Galilee and convince all these men? Do you imagine for one minute that these men would have given up everything to follow Jesus if that had happened? Of course not. They would have probably laughed at it with amazement and they would have said, how does he do it? Jesus looks at them and says, no, no sign will be given. And off he goes, leaving them alone. You might imagine that you would believe if you saw a man raised from the dead. Well, a man has been raised from the dead, but you still don't believe. If someone walked in here tonight and said that Wednesday evening they dropped dead and they've been in the paddocks, since in a box waiting for burial and that they had been raised from the dead would you have been won over by that miracle no you would be saying well the doctors got that wrong didn't they what a useless diagnosis that was do you want a real miracle tonight because i can show you one this is the real miracle tonight this book there are dozens of them in this building. This is a book that has come to us from heaven and it tells us what God wants to say to us. You'd pay big money, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you tonight to be in the presence of one of the great minds that are in the world even today? Well, here's the greatest mind ever revealed to us in the pages of the book of the Bible it is the breath of God. The Bible is called spirit and life. There are no shortage of miracles today, you see. A book from another world, inspired in its writing and supervised by God, miraculous in its tone and message and the beauty of its composition and its astonishing startling claims and it shows me accurately the living God and tells me how I can be known by him and how, how I can know him and how I can live forever. Here's a book that tells me how I can receive eternal life. So let me know this book. Let me devour this book. These Pharisees come to ask Jesus questions what they were actually doing was testing him, we're told, in verse 1. And what they're saying is, this is the basis on which we're prepared to believe you. If you perform a miracle for us right now, 
right here, we'll become disciples. Laying down conditions upon which they would receive him. He would have to do what they said. And if they considered that he had passed the test, uh, well then they might serve him. Let him prove that he is incarnate God. And you see, what that attitude does is to turn everything upside down. Because in the experiences of life, it's not we who test God, it is God who tests us. We are being tested. And we're not to try and turn it on its head. We're not to try and reverse those things. And we're not to say, I'll put God to the test now. I don't know if God is all he's cracked up to be, whether he really exists and whether he really loves me or not. So God has to do certain things. And if he does them here and now, well, he might just pass muster. That is not how it is, and that is not how it will ever be. You have to realise that what is actually happening is that the Bible is, teaching, is, is testing us, and Jesus Christ in the New Testament always is searching us. Every time we come close to the Bible, it's saying to us, are you willing to follow Jesus Christ? We don't put him to the test. Here were these Pharisees who could have interviewed that uh, Syrophoenician woman and her little go girl. And uh, they could have seen that miracle taking place and seen Jesus walking on the water and feeding the 5,000. Every time Jesus does something like that, he's testing us. I've done all this. You're still not satisfied, he says. In Mark's Gospel at this point, it says... Jesus sighed deeply. It's the only time that this word is used in the New Testament. It's the sort of sigh that people give when they're utterly exasperated with other people. He's saying, I've done all this. You're still not satisfied. You see, there is not a lack of evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. If only there were enough proof I would believe. It isn't like that at all. Rather, the problem is this, your enmity, the enmity of your heart against God. You will not have Jesus to rule over you. The problem then is not the absence of sufficient miracles for you, it's an absence of willingness in you. And deeper than any man's inability to believe on Christ is his unwillingness to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not bow to him this great sign that God has given to us. And so the Bible is a closed book because we close it ourselves and we keep hardening our heart against God and no sign will be given to us. Jesus was grieved by these people, grieved by their response. And what we see then is that this is a a miracle that calls us never to forget the mighty works of Jesus Christ. Jesus, <coughs> grieved, gets into the boat with the disciples. He's no doubt thinking of the Pharisees, the hardness of their hearts, what sort of spirit was in them that they could see him stand before thousands and with a few loaves and fishes feed them. What kind of spirit was in them that they could see him opening the eyes of the blind and healing the lame and the deaf and and then immediately after confront him and demand a sign what sort of spirit was in them and so he speaks to the disciples you watch out he says beware of the leaven the yeast of the pharisees don't let that spirit get down deep into your souls when you're dissatisfied with what god gives to you and you require more on your terms. That is a terrible kind of yeast that ferments away in a man and makes him bitter and restless, an opponent of Jesus Christ. The yeast of the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, that wanted to see Jesus dead. Well, do you listen to the cautions of God's word? When Jesus says to you, beware, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Are you willing to take that as a word of reproof and correction for you? 
The disciples didn't understand it, did they? They heard the demands of the Pharisees of Jesus for a sign, but they didn't connect that with the warning that Jesus was giving them when he says, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's annoyed with us because we've forgotten to bring bread, they say. So the Lord is stern with them and he plies question after question in verse 8 through 11 when he's saying you've heard and seen so much how is it you don't understand so he warns them strongly you consider all the privileges that you've had the miracles that you've seen close up the miracles that you've participated in you were with me when we collected the bread from the 5,000 and from the 4,000, the vast amount of food that was produced for those multitudes, you were there. You observed the scene when uh, I did this and so many other miracles on earth. Do you not yet understand? Don't you know who I am? This absence of food on this little journey what is that in comparison to the miracles you've just witnessed? They'd seen an astonishing miracle, and yet they'd seen nothing, as it were. They had heard amazing things, everything that Jesus had said, but it's as if they'd heard nothing. They'd listened to his warning, but they'd listened to nothing. Now, why I say that is because it's always a temptation to end end a sermon on a bit of a high note that sends us home singing. I want us to take seriously what Jesus says here to, to these disciples. Some passages of scriptures here intended to send us home with our tail between our legs. And if, if I understand this passage correctly, what it's saying to us is that it is possible to be in the presence of Jesus for a long time to hear his words, to observe his works, and to learn absolutely nothing from it. And in the end, to be no better, but rather worse. There was a way from the midst of the apostles, from the midst of the band of disciples, to hell. And Judas took that way. It's possible to be under the pastoral care of Jesus and still to die in unbelief. Because faith in miracles is not saving faith. To perform miracles is not the sign of a man who's going to heaven. Paul says, I can speak with the tongue of men and of angels. And yet, go to hell. Jesus warns us, in the last days there are many who will say that they had performed mighty works in his name and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So we're to remember what is recorded here of the disciples and to have it correct any arrogant thought, any arrogant thought in our own hearts and minds that uh, we can stand in judgment over the word of God. Let every man who thinks he knows anything realize he knoweth no nothing yet as he ought. And yet I can't send you home with just a rebuke, can I? Let's think of Jesus who is now in heaven and how he deals with these disciples on this occasion and uh, to see that he doesn't despise them. Doesn't despise them. As slow of heart as they were, as backward as they were to learn, uh, Jesus nonetheless is patient with them. And he goes on from this point, teaching them line upon line, precept upon precept. He's taking them with him up to Jerusalem. Peter, as dense and as slow as he so often was, and yet Jesus working with him as he receives the word of God, till in the end he's standing before that crowd of 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, preaching this this Christ. He can do that for us if we receive him as the bread of life, as the bread of life. The Lord bless his word to us tonight. Let's pray. 
Our gracious God, we thank you that you did not give up on these disciples. We thank you that the word you spoke to them is a word also to us. How is it that you do not yet understand? Oh Lord, as we stand before your word, as we sit under the sound of your word, Lord's day by Lord's day, grant that it would truly be food for our souls, that we would put ourselves under it, not over it, that we would not be judges of your word, but that we would receive your word with patience and with fear. And grant that as you did not give up on your disciples, but you loved them to the very end, grant, Lord, that that same patience would be shown to us, that you'd teach us, that we might receive your word as, uh, as better than our daily food. We ask these mercies for your namesake. Amen.